Good day, Deep and Word family. Welcome to day 121 of our Bible study review. Today we're going through chapters 19 through 22 of the book of Isaiah. Chapter 19 is an oracle, or I guess you can say a burden against Egypt. And it opens up saying that Yahuwah, he rides on a cloud swift over Egypt. And he says that he will make the council of Egypt fall to nothing. Their idols will fall down. Verse four reads, it says, the Egyptians I will give over into the hand of a cruel Lord and a fierce king shall rule over them, says the Adon, Lord of hosts. And so we know that the Egyptians were conquered by the Assyrians. The Assyrians were very cruel. They would rip the babies out of the mother's wombs and dash them against, you know, stones. They were extremely cruel. So just remember that because it was the Assyrians at this point in time in history who were the superpower. And that's what they did when they conquered cities. That's how they brought them low to their knees. They were one of the most cruel empires. So the prophecy or the oracle, I guess you could say, continues and says that the waters of the Niles of the rivers, like the waters will dry up and the fishermen, those who, you know, cast out a line, they won't catch anything. And those who cast out their nets, they also will not catch a thing. And it sends people weeping. Then it goes on to say that the counselors of Pharaoh have become stupid. Right here in verse 14, it says, Yahuwah has mingled a perverse spirit in her so that they have caused Egypt to err in her every work as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. So the power and the glory and the splendor of Egypt that once was is being brought low by the Assyrians. But then if we skip to verse 17, it says this, the land of Judah shall become a terror to Egypt, right? It's like the tables are turning. Let's read verses 19 through 21. It says, and that day there shall be an altar to Yahuwah in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to Yahuwah in its border. It shall be for a sign and for a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt, for they shall cry to Yahuwah because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a savior and a champion, and he shall deliver them. And it says that Yahuwah shall be known in Egypt, and the Egyptians shall know Yahuwah in that day, and shall worship with sacrifice and offering. They shall make a vow to Yahuwah and perform it. So it looks like it's talking about this future time. I know that we have read Zechariah chapter 14 and that the Egyptians will come up, right? And no one, no nation will be able to come up empty handed when they come up to our Messiah during the millennial reign. Let's keep reading in verse 23. It says, in that day, there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria and the Egyptians shall worship with the Assyrians. So these two enemies of each other will come and worship together. They will have this peace among each other and they will worship the one true L. It says, in that day, Israel shall be the third group with Egypt and Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts, right, Yahuwah, Sabuot, has blessed, saying, blessed is Egypt, my people, what? And Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Imagine the southern kingdom of Judah hearing these words right now, that Yahuwah Elohim is calling Egypt a blessed people. And we know that at this time, King Hezekiah was actually seeking a political alliance with Egypt secretly, okay? So although they have this horrible past with them at this moment in time, he's seeking some solace, right? Some alliance with Egypt. But all in all, Yahuwah is calling Egypt a blessed people. And he's calling the Assyrians, their enemy at this time, the work of his hands. And then he calls Israel his inheritance, which that's not a surprise. But the surprise is that they will all come together and worship the one true El together. Imagine Jonah hearing these words. Jonah was told to go and speak this word to Nineveh so that they may repent and receive salvation. And Jonah's like, absolutely not. I don't want to preach this word to them. Do you understand what they have done to us? I want them to be judged by you. Why are you sending me to my enemy? So we get a glimpse of the Heavenly Father calling Jonah to love his enemy <laughs> like himself. But that's a hard word for many of us to hear. But our ultimate enemy is not flesh and blood. It is Satan himself. And he overpowers minds, bodies, and spirits so that they would not receive salvation, so that they remain in chains. But this is a future prophecy about all men, right? All men, even those who, you know, did not originally come 
from the covenant people, they can be grafted in. They can be saved through the one savior of the world, the champion who is Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. And chapter 20 is a prophecy against the Ethiopians and Egypt. As you know, Ethiopia was called Cush and they overtook the land of Egypt, right? They overtook this. So this prophecy is against both of them. And it says, in the year that the Tartan came to Ashdod, and this is the place of the Philistines, right? It says, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him and he fought against Ashdod and took it at the same time, Yahuwah spoke to Isaiah saying, he was telling him, I need you to walk barefoot and I need you to walk naked as a sign to Egypt and Cush. Verse three, let's read it. It says, Yahuwah said, even as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia, so the king of Assyria shall lead away the Egyptians as prisoners and Ethiopians as captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Then they shall be dismayed and ashamed of Ethiopia, their hope, and Egypt, their boast. Because we know that King Hezekiah was making a political alliance. And that's where he was placing his hope and his trust. He wasn't placing his hope and his trust in Yahuwah Elohim. Now, I know that we reviewed this yesterday, but if you want to go back and see proof of this, it's in 2 Kings chapter 18, and it starts in verse 19. And you will see that the Assyrians, they were mad at King Hezekiah because he knew that he had made a political alliance with Egypt, which who had overtaken Egypt at that time was Cush, the Ethiopians. Now we move on to chapter 21, and this is a prophecy against Babylon, which Babylon has not become the world power as of yet, but Isaiah is seeing these things way in advance. So I'm going to start reading from verse 2, and this is what it says. A grievous vision is declared to me. The treacherous one still deals treacherously, and the destroyer still destroys. Go up, O Elam. Lay siege, O media. So Elam is the Persians. So the Persians and the, the Medes are the ones who took over Babylon. That was the second world power after the Babylonians, after Nebuchadnezzar. And it says, all her singing I have made to cease. And later on, Yahuwah confirms these words that he had spoken through the prophet, this vision that he has given the prophet Isaiah when we get to the book of Daniel, which is when Judah is actually exiled to Babylon. And we know that Nebuchadnezzar, he had this vision, right? It says that Yahuwah gave him that dream and he sees that there's this head of gold, there's this chest of silver, there's this skirt of bronze, and then there's these legs of iron and clay. Well, Nebuchadnezzar is the gold head, right? But after him will be the Persians and the Medes. And we know that after this, Nebuchadnezzar, he rebelled against the image that he saw and he made this image of all gold because he wanted his kingdom to go on forever. And that is the spirit of Babylon. Babylon is the spirit, you know, is, is Satan's spirit, I guess you can say. And he wants his kingdom to reign forever. But Satan only has a short period of time, like a small lease upon the earth. His time is coming up. Then in verse six, we see that Isaiah is told by the Lord. It says, uh, to set a watchman upon the wall, upon the wall of Babylon. And when he starts to see these chariots coming, that he should announce these things as he sees them. So let's read in verse eight about this watchman. When he sees things, what does he declare? And it says, the watchman called, O Lord, I stand continually on the watchtower in the daytime, and I am stationed at my guard post every night. Look, here comes a chariot of men, horsemen in pairs. And he answered and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, and all of the graven images of her gods lie shattered on the ground. So this right here is, yes, a double prophecy, or you could say the law of double reference, because we know this is going to happen to the physical Babylon with King Nebuchadnezzar and those who follow after him. But this is also talking about a future time of spiritual Babylon. It will fall and all of the wicked oppressors that go along with her will fall because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will come and conquer all of their kingdoms and all of the kingdoms of the earth will come under the yoke of the one true King, the everlasting King, Yeshua HaMashiach. Then there's this prophecy against Edom, right? Edom is Esau. That's who they are. The Edomites are the descendants of Esau. Esau was the twin brother of 
Jacob, all right? And our scriptures say that there's bad blood between them until the very end. But right now, at this moment in time, in this prophecy, the watchman on the wall doesn't see anything. But at any moment, this thing could change. Why? Because the fate of all men, right? The fate of all kingdoms is still in the hands of the creator, right? There's nothing that happens that surprises him. He is still in control. And then there's this prophecy against Arabia. And it says at the very end of the chapter that within a year, that there'll be no men to hire, right? That all men will scatter from uh, Kedar or Kedar, which is like the glory of Arabia. And it says the glory of their nation as well will fall. Why? Because Yahuwah said it would. Chapter 22 is a prophecy against Jerusalem. That's the Valley of Vision. It is Jerusalem, the southern kingdom of Judah. And this is concerning the Babylonians coming to lay siege of the city. It says that the people are going onto their rooftops and they're not dying by the sword. They're dying by hunger. That's what other kingdoms would do when they would surround other cities. They would lay siege of the city and they would cut off their water supply. They would destroy their crops and they would starve them out. That's how Judah was perishing from within. They were starving. And so while this is happening, we see that Judah is not crying out to their Yahuwah Elohim. Judah is taking things within their own hands, within their own strength. So they're tearing down their own homes to take the stones from their homes and to build up a stronger tower against the Babylonians. And instead of repenting and mourning, they're not. They're still, you know, slaughtering what they have left and they're, they're drinking wine and they're being merry. And their words that they spoke were, let us eat and drink because tomorrow what's going to happen to us is what's going to happen to us. They have no repentant heart. And we see that this happens at the very end as well when the wrath of Yahuwah Elohim is pouring out upon all of the world, right? They're still bawling their fist up and they're mad at Yahuwah Elohim. He's giving them a chance to repent, but they're still eating and drinking and being merry. They're just loving their sin and they refuse to repent. Well, this is what Judah looked like when the Babylonians were coming to lay siege of the city. At the end of chapter 22, there's a prophecy against Shebna, who is the treasurer of King Hezekiah. And he is not seeking out for the well-being of the people. He is seeking after self. So he takes his power and his position and he starts to make his own tomb in this, you know, in this high place. He makes his own tomb. And Yahuwah Elohim says, you will not lay in that high tomb. He goes, I'm going to take your power and your position away from you and give it to another man, Eliakim. Well, the people place their trust in Eliakim, and Eliakim is called a strong peg. And at the very end, Yahuwah says, I will remove the strong peg. And eventually we know that Judah is going to be overpowered by Babylon. Why? They continue to sin. Their trust is not in their Yahuwah Elohim. They have shed so much innocent blood and the judgment is rendered. The time is coming. Babylon will come and overtake you. Nothing is going to stop this. So what do we take away from these prophecies, right? We know that our Yahuwah Elohim, he is sovereign. The earth and all that is in it belongs to him, right? He causes kings and nations to rise to power and he causes them to fall, to bring all of his word to completion. None of this surprises him whatsoever. He is the sovereign one who is playing, you know, checkmate on all of us. He calls the shots long before they ever happen. He spoke these prophecies through the mouth of Isaiah long before they happened. At this point in time, Assyria was the superpower. But he talks about the Assyrians being downtrodden and how Babylon would rise to power. But who would come through and conquer Babylon as well? Why does he do this? So that our confidence would be in him right? He knows. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. This should affirm and confirm our belief, our knowing that he is the one true El, and nothing happens by happenstance. He is not a man that he should lie. He is creator. Our Yahuwah Elohim is always ever-present. He's always living in the now, and he's able to reveal to his prophets, right, to the image bearers, what will happen in the future. And he also used Moses to reveal what happened in the past, right? So he used Moses to tell the story of the beginning days of creation with Adam and Eve, with the garden. And so this should solidify our trust 
in him because everything that he has spoken has come to pass. And there's evidence all over the world for a worldwide flood. There's evidence for Sodom and Gomorrah. There's evidence that Babylon was downtrodden and that jackals and hyenas, that's all that inhabits that place. They're not able to rebuild that place. Why? Because he spoke it that no man would ever dwell there again. And that is the truth. This should solidify your trust in him. This right here, is why you need to study and show yourself approved. This right here is why you need to read the front of the book. Prophecies are the bread and butter against the mockers and scoffers who say that our Yahuwah Elohim is just some sky daddy, some mystical creature, and that he's just a legend. No, sir, no, ma'am. These prophecies were given way before Babylon was ever a world power. These prophecies were given to show who would overthrow Babylon as a world power. There's evidence all over this earth for the words that he has spoken and written through his prophets, the Sea of Reeds, the Red Sea, still have those wheels of chariots in them. The Ark of Noah's Ark has been found exactly where in scripture it says it would be. His markers are all across this earth, y'all. At that point in time, Isaiah was just prophesying about things that would come to pass. And they came to pass. They are recorded in our history books. We can trust that what he says about the future also will come to pass. Some people are hard-headed and they won't hear the gospel, but maybe if you show them the truth of history, maybe they will. Maybe their hearts will start to soften. Y'all, there's many ways to testify that the one true L is the one true L. I hope that this puts the fire in your belly like it does for me. Deep and Word family, that's all that I have for you today. Until tomorrow, y'all bless.